The Trumpet Daily with Stephen Flurry. Well, it's nice to be back in Edmond for a brief uh, visit to God's headquarters. Over the past six months, as you know, we've been in Jerusalem with many of your uh, fellow students, many of your fellow college students. And while we've been in the Middle East, there have been numerous, numerous earth-shaking developments, particularly uh, in the nation of Egypt. Of course, many other nations have been impacted by these tumultuous events. But in Egypt, in particular, there have been some developments that even while we've been there have just been stunning. We got there in late May uh, of this year, and just a few days in or a, a week or two into our stay, the Muslim Brotherhood won the presidential election in Egypt. And if you remember, just prior to that election, Egypt's military court had pulled the rug supposedly out from underneath Mohamed Morsi. Uh, there was chaos in the political process. The parliament was dissolved. The, the military was really asserting its power because it was concerned, it was worried. And so there were some who said that, well, this is just uh, the beginning of the end for the so-called weak government, Morsi's government. Now at the time, we were saying that this power struggle might continue on for a number of months, but that eventually uh, the brotherhood would rise to the top. It was only a matter of time we said, before Egypt became a radical Islamist state. And as it turns out, that power struggle lasted for about two months. That's it. Eight, nine weeks. And the power struggle was over. In, in August, President Morsi fired his top military chiefs. He fired the top military men. The military was supposed to have all the power, remember? And he fired those top chiefs. And in this bold move, Carolyn Glick wrote in response to it in the Jerusalem Post, she said, this move completed, it completed Egypt's transformation into an Islamist state. Now, following on that, we had on the cover, if you remember uh, the October, November uh, Trumpet magazine, there was a picture of Morsi embracing uh, Ahmadinejad in Iran. And we talked about how the United States had lost Egypt and then we ask the question below that headline, is it losing the Middle East? That was right there on the heels of what happened with uh, all of those military chiefs being sacked by Morsi. Let's look at Daniel 11. We've been here so many times, I know. But it's pretty amazing to think about what is happening and even what we were saying back after August. I mean, we put that magazine together in September. And now there's another magazine that's uh, on the newsstand. But if you go back a couple of issues to that trumpet cover with Morsi and Ahmadinejad, it really makes the more recent drama in Egypt seem almost anticlimactic. We've heard this past week about this uh, so-called Islamist takeover of Egypt, and really it's, it's already happened. It happened months ago. Daniel chapter 11. Verse 40, it says, and at the time of the end, so this is speaking of just before Jesus Christ returns to this earth, at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him. The king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. So this king of the north is going to be that German-led uh, European power. The, the modern-day resurrection of the Holy Roman Empire coming right out of the heart of Europe. And it's going to be a mighty power sending all these ships, all of these armaments to clash with the king of the south, which is headed by Iran. We've said this for almost 20 years, that Iran would lead this radical Islamic uh, movement now, how soon do you think this clash could happen? Well, we don't know for sure. God certainly give a, given us the playbook so we can follow these events and we know where they're headed. But as far as how soon it could happen, well, just think about how fast things are happening in Egypt because they're a critical part or component of this prophecy as the next few verses bring out. Look at verse 42. It says, he shall stretch forth his hand. This is speaking of the king of the north. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. 
And so Egypt won't escape this whirlwind attack coming from Europe, coming from the King of the North, which is uh, why, as we've said for, again, almost 20 years, um, that it was prophesied to be allied with Iran. Because when the King of the North comes against the King of the South like a whirlwind, Egypt won't escape that, that onslaught. And so, if you go back as far as 1993, my father wrote in the Trumpet magazine, Islamic extremism is gaining power at a frightening pace in Egypt. This is in 1993. He wrote, I believe this prophecy in Daniel 11:42 indicates that you're about to see a radical change in Egyptian politics. That was in 1993. Of course, what happened in 2011? We uh, saw headlines all over the world about the Arab Spring, and that's been another astonishing tidbit to this story, is to see how the Western officials, to see how the major media has really endorsed this revolution. It's supported this revolution. It's encouraged this. Jumping forward to 2006, this is from a letter my father wrote in January of that year. He said, watch for Cairo to distance itself from America. Should the Muslim Brotherhood ever take control, there's no doubt that a strong alliance between Iran and Egypt will be built. That was in 06. In 2009, this is the article that my father wrote uh, soon after the Cairo speech that President Obama gave early on in his first term. My father said, Egypt is about to experience a radical change. No doubt, no doubt, the Muslim Brotherhood is going to gain control of Egypt. So this is now fulfilled prophecy. This is fulfilled prophecy. And look at how this fulfilled prophecy has dramatically shaken the region. Not just the region, really. It's shaken the world. Look at what happened soon after Morsi sacked those military chiefs. That was in August. And I think we remember what happened in September. September the 11th, those terrorist attacks against the United States positions all across the Middle East. And the focus since then has understandably been on Benghazi because of the horrific nature of that strike. But if you remember on that day, the terrorists' first strike was at the U.S. Embassy in Egypt, in Cairo. That's where the movement began. That's where the violence was triggered. It all started when that Salafist television station screened that YouTube video to try to incite this angry reaction from a mob, and the mob did react violently to that movie. Uh, and some would say it's a spontaneous demonstration, but the people that planned for the screening, the people that played it before the mob, they planned months in advance for the attack to take place on September the 11th. It was a premeditated strike on the United States, as it was in Benghazi. I mean, that's obvious. It was obvious from day one, if you were reading the trumpet, Never mind those who are trying to cover it up. But it was obvious. Look at Daniel 11 and verse 43, staying here in this chapter. It says, But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. And so this king of the north comes sweeping into the territory and just wipes out the king of the south. And he has power over the treasures of the region, over all of the precious things of Egypt, it says. Egypt, here again, is an emphasis. I mean, God puts special emphasis on Egypt, on what's happening in Egypt. And then it continues. Notice the last part of the scripture. This is almost like an additional uh, afterthought that's thrown in. It says, and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps, speaking of Egypt. So here is Libya, here is Ethiopia. They're drug right into this. I mean, Egypt is, I mean, this shows how critical the position is of Egypt. How influential Egypt is throughout the region. Going back to that October-November issue with uh, Morsi and Ahmadinejad on the cover. Notice what we wrote. This was, you know, we put this together in September. 
It says Egypt is the real power behind Libya and Ethiopia, which suggests that it is going to have a heavy hand in swinging those two nations into the Iranian camp. Egypt would have a hand in swinging those nations over into this radical Islamist camp. Now, we were saying this actually back in February of 2011, even before the revolution began in Libya, that Libya, because of this prophecy, was going to swing into the Iranian camp. And we continued saying this right through to that issue a few months ago, just before those attacks on September the 11th. My father said, we need to understand the enormous impact that Egypt, working with Iran, will have in the Middle East and even globally. It says this Iran-Egypt axis is going to change the game in the Middle East, particularly in Libya and Ethiopia. He says, put simply, this means that we can expect, with Iran's help, we can expect uh, Egypt to lead Libya and Ethiopia into the Iranian camp. And so here again, what we are seeing play out on television news channels all over the world right now is fulfilled prophecy. Fulfilled prophecy. And as I say, one of the stunning developments in all of this is how that the United States has helped to bring this about by offering its hearty endorsement for the spread of radical Islam. We have been a facilitator. Now look at the most recent events that we've seen transpire in Egypt. Uh, you have this eight day war between Israel and Hamas. Israel was tracking these movements of missiles that were being delivered to Sudan from Iran and then making their way through Sudan, through Egypt, disassembled at the border, shipped through the tunnels into Gaza, and we saw during that eight-day war how Hamas had expanded its firing range significantly from 10 to 12 miles to 40 to 45 miles. This is because of the support that Iran is giving it. And so you have that eight-day battle, the bombing campaign, Operation Pillar of Defense, Hamas firing those 1,500 rockets. Hamas firing some 250 even before Israel started its offensive. Clearly, clearly trying to start a war, trying to bait Israel into a war. And it worked, and it lasted for eight days. And did you notice what Egypt did during that conflict? Well, Morsi immediately blamed Israel for killing civilians. He didn't say anything about the thousands of rockets that he helped, that he helped deliver to Hamas. Nothing was said about that. As soon as that eight-day offensive from Israel <laughs> broke out, then Morsi withdrew his ambassador to Tel Aviv in protest. He sent a diplomat into Gaza to show his support for Hamas's position. And then, incredibly, as hostilities came to an end last week, it was Morsi who was credited with bringing peace to the region. Morsi was the one who drew up the ceasefire, supposedly. It was Morsi who dialed down the, the hostilities. I mean, this was quite a political boon for the Egyptian president. Now he's a, a diplomat. Now he's a peacemaker. Now he's a broker. Secretary Clinton said uh, last Wednesday, about the president. I want to thank President Morsi for his personal leadership to de-escalate the situation in Gaza and end the violence. He was the one responsible for escalating the conflict and then he's congratulated for de-escalating it, for calling off the attack dogs, basically. She went on to say, Egypt's new government is assuming the responsibility and leadership that has long made this country a cornerstone for regional stability and peace. She says the United States position is that Egypt is a cornerstone for stability and peace in the region. The New York Times also reported about the many phone calls between President Obama and President Morsi leading up to the ceasefire agreement. 
According to the Times, Mr. Obama told aides he was impressed with the Egyptian leader's pragmatic confidence. He sensed an engineer's precision with surprisingly little ideology. Most important, Mr. Obama told aides that he considered Mr. Morsi a straight shooter who delivered on what he promised and did not promise what he could not deliver. High praise coming from a U.S. president. Here is a, in Egypt, we have a pragmatic leader who's confident and who shows no, really very little ideology in his decision making. And here the man comes straight from the Muslim Brotherhood, a radical terrorist organization, if ever there was one. Never mind what they say in the left wing press that they've renounced violence and they're here to bring peace. As one commentator said the other day, you look at what's happening now with this, this uh, takeover, basically. Not just the military wing, as happened in August, but now the judiciary as well. The last line of defense to keep Morsi from becoming a dictator with more powers than even President Mubarak had. Now he made that move, that power grab, the day after he won all of this high praise from the United States. I mean, I think he was feeling pretty good. If not working some deal behind the scenes ahead of time that, okay, I'll tell Hamas to back off, but you leave me alone with my domestic policies. Who knows what goes on behind closed doors, but we know this in just a matter of months President Morsi went from barely, barely being elected as president of Egypt to now having absolute power in Cairo. He's above the law. And that's happened just since June of this year. Of course, we told you it would happen in 1993. And we told you when Mubarak was run out of town that it was going to happen. But who listens to God? Really, I mean, think about it. Who cares about what God says? God has a position. God told us in advance what would happen. And God tells us where this is headed. Let's just conclude over in Jeremiah 6. After Morsi made his announcement last week, I waited and waited and waited. I thought, well, surely the United States is going to come out and condemn this move. And the most that we could get from the U.S. government was that it raised concerns. <laughs> it raised concerns for the Islamists to become an absolute dictator, an autocrat, whatever you want to call it. He's got more power than Mubarak. And he's no friend of the United States that at least Mubarak was a friend. At least Mubarak advanced America's strategic foreign policy for the region. You can't say that about Egypt today. When you compare just how quickly the administration was coming forward, telling Mubarak to step down now, we can't wait for that seven, eight months. You've got to move, you've got to get out, you've got to clear the way. He was pressured to move and get out. And as he left, he warned the United States and he warned the rest of the world. You don't know what you're getting into. You're bringing a radical Islamist administration to the forefront in Egypt. And that has since happened. God told us that this would happen. And yet, man isn't in the habit of listening to God. We ignore God. Notice what else God says in Jeremiah 6 and verse 14. It says, They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people, slightly saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. That's what we can expect. That's what God prophesies. Here, this world, students, you think about this. This world is barreling toward World War III. And the leading voices of our day are doing what? Well, they're telling us to just stay calm. Don't worry. Everything's going to be okay. We're going to get, get peace. And that's exactly what God said they would say. 
Just this morning, I saw a headline in the New York Times, seeming retreat by Egypt leader on new powers. Well, you know, he did come out and claim that he was above the law, but it seems like he's retreating. I think there's, uh, he's getting some sense, the New York Times says, hopefully. It's just wishful thinking. His true colors were revealed long ago. And it's leading to a worldwide escalation in violence, not just in the Middle East, but all over the world. The message, though, coming from the leading voices, as I say, just glosses right over all of these problems and pretends that everything is okay. In the Living Bible, it says this, uh, or translates the, the verse this way, you can't heal a wound by saying it's not there. <laughs> you can't heal it by pretending it's not there. Some of you have been injured before. And you can't just get up from the injury and say, well, I guess there's no injury. It's not there. There is no pretend in the real world. Elsewhere in the Bible, this is in Isaiah 59 and verse 8, God says, the way of peace they know not. This is speaking of man. And there is no judgment in their goings. They have made them crooked paths. Whosoever goes therein shall not know peace. That has been man's legacy. We don't know the way to peace. And this is why. And here's where there is a silver lining. We do have to look beyond the widespread suffering that's coming because there, there is a silver lining. It's because man doesn't know the way to peace that Jesus Christ will return to this earth and bring peace to the world because there's no other way for the world to attain it than through Christ. Christ. 